Good morning, and welcome to the ID Tech X show here in Berlin. This event is all about showcasing a range of emerging technologies and how they're addressing change and big opportunities in a number of different industries. To that extent, over the coming two days, we have a range of end users who will be talking about a different range of case studies and their challenges within the industries they're in. And then you'll be hearing from many different solution providers, all the way from those making components to those making materials, to learn about uh, the new capabilities that are coming through and how they are addressing those problems. I think we've got a truly great show for you over the coming two days. We have a record number of exhibitors. We've seen double-digit growth um, in terms of exhibitor numbers, and we're almost up to about 3,000 attendees coming from a whopping 58 countries. So truly international, lots to see, lots to learn, and also ultimately it's about making business, you know, and hopefully you'll meet uh, many interesting contacts who could be potential partners or customers. So let me tell you a bit more about ID TechX. Of course, we are the host of this event, and uh, events are one way of uh, ways we disseminate information. Our objective is to provide the best business intelligence we can on a range of different emerging technologies, and the sectors we look at are shown here on this slide. We do that by having a range of experts who address these different areas, doing a lot of primary research in addition to secondary research. We pull all this information together to provide data, including technology assessments, company profiling, market sizing, and market forecasts. And we disseminate this information through forums, through events such as this, but also through reports and subscriptions. The aim is that we can provide our clients with uh, data so they can make better business decisions as they look to move their business forward in these different topics. This year, the company is also celebrating its 20th birthday, and we now operate from bases in Japan, Germany, UK, USA, and we also have people further afield from South Africa to China to Korea. Of course, we need to be very international to track the progress of these technologies. So do come by and take a look at our booth um, to learn a bit more about what we do and potentially how we can help you. So moving on to the event, let me tell you a bit more about the format of the show. As you're all here, you're probably fairly familiar with it, but this is really eight events in one. The topics we're covering are shown here on the left, all the way from 3D printing down to wearable technology. And we've decided to co-locate these. So each of these has its own full two-day conference track in parallel with each other over today and tomorrow. But they're co-located with a single common exhibition. And the reason we do that is that there's a huge amount of overlap and interest between these different topic areas. So, for example, if you're involved in materials, take, uh, for example, graphene, which is one area we look at. That can be applied to technologies such as energy storage and printed electronics, which in turn are applicable to sectors such as electric vehicles, wearable, and IoT. So by bringing all these supply chains together, um, you can see the full range of different end users from different industries, and those end users can see the new components and capabilities coming through. And similarly, material supplies and component supplies can meet with different users from different end user categories to understand what are, their, sorry, what are their needs and their challenges. In addition to that, um, overarching those, I think we have four key themes at this event, which is shown here on the right. They include the new form factors of electronics which are coming through, such as flexible, stretchable, and also structural electronics. We also have the increasing ubiquity of electronics, which is another key trend. Then there's huge change occurring within industry. So sectors like retail, healthcare, and mobility will be heavily covered at the show. And many of the different changes are being uh, enabled through uh, better and more functional materials and manufacturing innovations, which will also be covered at this event. What I want to do now over the next 25 minutes or so is just to walk you through uh, these four areas in particular and really whet your appetite to give you an idea as to what will be coming um, over the next few days to give you some idea of the key trends that we see. Now I'm going to start off first by looking at the new form factors of electronics which are coming through. So the first key area and main trend we see with new form factors which are going to market is the progress with flexible electronics. And nowhere is that more prevalent right now than in the commercialization of flexible and foldable OLED displays. This has been a long time coming, but it's potentially a savior to a consumer electronic tablet and phone market which is seeing saturation and in many cases decline as well. 
This gives more than an incremental improvement to the product. It's a step change improvement, allowing all organizations to steal market share, who can move quickly with a good product, um, and also to capture more margin um, versus what they've been losing over the last few years. In the center here, you can see our data about the growth of the OLED display industry. In 2022, we think that 23 million foldable OLED display units will be sold, rising to 300 million units in 2029, representing a $20 billion value. And the progression has been from OLED displays on glass, on glass to rigid plastic, and now to fully foldable displays. But it's not all just about reinventing products. Flexible electronics is also enabling completely new market categories. We see a range of different flexible electronics components, which we covered at the show, from batteries to sensors. And in the case of the example of the sensor shown here in the top right, this is a printed, flexible, organic photo detector strip, which is being used for warehouse management control. And here we have examples of companies who aren't just trying to replace conventional components, but they're pioneering new markets. So moving beyond being a component provider all the way through uh, the value chain to being a complete solution provider. And you'll be seeing many organizations at the event who are doing just that, creating new markets rather than replacing anything. So flexible electronics is one innovation in form factors, but another that we'll be addressing at this event is the rise of stretchable electronics. And here we see the first commercial examples in the form of stretchable electrodes and stretchable sensors, which are now in the marketplace. These are being used for very different applications, but one in particular, which we'll look at at this event, is the e-textile market, which in 2019 is worth over $200 million. It's being used in everything from sportswear to monitor things like heart rate to hospital bed sheets to monitor pressure and therefore present body, prevent body sores from occurring if people are not moved frequently enough. The value of stretchable electronics components, according to research that we have done at IDTechX, in 2028 will be over $400 million. But that's just the value of the components. The value of the markets it's creating will be much bigger. So the value of the e-textile industry, for example, in the same time frame, will be $2 billion, or just over $2 billion in that year. And then we have structural electronics. Now, at IDTechX, we are very strong advocates of structural electronics and have been so for a number of years. And that's because we think it will create completely new markets from nothing today. There's many different technologies which are enabling and feeding into structural electronics. And they have benefits such as lightweighting, space saving, and providing design versatility in 3D. At this event, we'll be going through the full range of structural electronics um, components and enabling technologies. And on this slide here, I just show a few examples as to how structural electronics is now beginning to get traction in the marketplace and how it's being used in uh, different areas. On one hand, we have in-model electronics. Uh, this incorporates print electronics, printing onto a flat sheet, then thermoforming, and then injection molding to create 3D shapes. And here we can do away with a high number of parts which need to be integrated to just one piece. And that's something that those in the automotive industry are very much looking forward to progressing to. It also means much more durable parts and the ability to uh, get to market more quickly with different designs, uh, being able to customize it more easily with printing as opposed to having to assemble many different components. So we see the market size for in-model electronics therefore rising to over a billion dollars 10 years from now. Then in the center, in a completely different example, we have structural PV. Um, and this is uh, causing radical change in areas of mobility. For example, uh, we have in development, and now in uh, pilot stages, autonomous robotic weeders um, with solar on their skin. And so they never do need to be plugged in, provided it's sunny enough. They just trundle up and down the fields doing their job. That technology is now also progressing to small vehicles. It's also appearing on uh, boats and also electric aircraft. And it's really a step forward to minimizing the battery size we need and even eventually doing away with batteries altogether by generating energy from the bodywork itself. Just one angle of that is the move to energy independent electric vehicles. And as you can see from our data at the bottom here, that's growing to a multi-billion dollar market over 10 years too. And the reason why I'm showing this data is to really highlight that huge new billion dollar markets will be created from nothing, which is why we think it's such an exciting opportunity and one we cover at this event. There's also much more going on, including this concept of massless energy. So that is combining, say for example, structural PV 
with energy storage, such as supercapacitors. And both of these, of course, generate energy, they store energy, but in addition to that, they are load-bearing as well. So now the structure becomes a functional part. Um, and here we see many improvements, including on the right here, um, examples of significant light weighting as a result. So we've looked at some of the trends in form factors, which we covered this show. I'm now going to move on to the increasing ubiquity of electronics. And of course, uh, driving much of that is the rise of IoT. And in this chart here, we have plotted the main application sectors for IoT, um, comparing them versus their level of interest, versus how many years they will be truly mainstream and really hit critical mass. As you can see, there's a very diverse range of applications coming to market at different rates. Leading the commercialization are government-based projects, and here government uh, seeks efficiency and safety. They're trying to manage more and more people living in cities, and therefore uh, there's a lot of uh, mandates or investment that they're doing around smart meters, monitoring utilities, the grid, um, parking, and so on. Not far behind that, we have consumer IoT, which is really a completely different application area. And here, this includes the rise of smart appliances from light bulbs to thermostats and, and much more, which is gaining good traction now and getting more and more popular, including the systems becoming much more integrated. So uh, a single hub via voice control can control these different sorts of systems. Here, the race is on by the biggest in consumer electronics to really own the smart home platform, so everything is compatible with their platform, um, and we'll see how that shakes out over the coming years. And then finally, if we look at the application of IoT within industrial applications, you can see the orange dots here are much more spread out, and that's mainly because these organizations are seeking very specific um, paybacks, um, they require a good return on investment, and they're getting a good return on investment. In applications such as predictive maintenance, we're seeing organizations getting their money back on the whole implementation of IoT within about 12 months. Another key driving area is logistics, where we see a range of low power, wide area networks, which are used to monitor and track assets, including providing sensor feedback. So talking of sensors, um, we also have an event, uh, a full, well, full two-day track at this show, looking at the innovations in sensor technologies. And I already discussed how sensors are changing form factor, they're becoming flexible. But here are a few other key trends that we'll be covering within the sensor portion of the show. The first main trend is that we see sensors getting much smaller and lower power, which means they can be put into more places. So a great example of that is the change that we see in the gas sensor market. The gas sensors, traditionally quite large, bulky, and quite expensive, are now getting much smaller, much cheaper, which means that um, they can be fit into more places. The holy grail of that being, say, the cell phone, which would be a billion plus units. Um, and that's going to create a market for gas sensors 10 years from now to be over $3 billion just for the value of the gas sensor component itself. Then, because we have sensors getting smaller um, and thinner as well, it also means there's increasing level of integration with other devices. So if we look at the display business, where many display makers have seen margins erode over a period of time, uh, they used to buy in the separate touch screen and put this on top of the display, but now they're integrating this into the display. And beyond that, we now have consumer electronics uh, devices on the market, which also integrate biometric sensors, so fingerprint scanners into the display as well. So the display maker is now capturing much more value and uh, margin. Moving on to the right, we also then have the trends of sensor fusion and digitalization. What I mean by sensor fusion is that while a single sensor will sense one parameter, for a number of applications, increasingly, we see a need for multiple sensors to provide the complete system. So good examples of that would be autonomous driving, where we need to sense short range, long range, and even uh, status of people within the vehicle. Um, another very different example, which is getting a lot of momentum at the moment, is the move to till-free supermarkets. Till-free supermarkets is not a new concept. It uh, came up with 20 years ago. But there's actually a lot happening now, and I think over the next five years, we're going to see much more progress. It's partly being enabled by machine vision, so image sensors, which have been developed for cell phones, which are really good, they're really cheap, and they're now being applied so they can identify things in stores in conjunction with other types of sensors, including things like uh, RFID and sensors in your phone. So now in Japan and China, there are several stores which are till-free, 
trialing all of these uh, sensors in this sort of sensor fusion environment. Um, Amazon have four stores where they've also eradicated tills, and they're being driven for different purposes. For example, in Japan, just to give you an idea as to the targets they've set, one of the Japanese ministries there have said that by 2025, they want to tag all retail items. That will be 100 billion units a year, and they've announced that in conjunction with the leading retailers in Japan. One of the drivers for them is that they're in a position where they have an aging population, not enough young people coming in uh, to uh, look after them and do other jobs, and they don't want these people stuck behind tills doing fairly menial tasks. So we're going to see a lot of automation thanks to things like sensor fusion in supermarkets, but all the way through to cars as well. And then finally, we see increasing intelligence at the edge when it comes to sensors. Um, with more and more sensors being deployed, there's much more data being generated. And uh, that means, you know, a strain on, on wireless communications. And so in some cases, not in every application, but in some cases, we're seeing some more added intelligence. So that's opportunities for things like microprocessors and so on uh, being added to the sensor node so that it can do some level of processing and therefore only send up, you know, exception level events or particular reports. So this progression with sensors, with connectivity, with new form factors of electronics all feeds in very nicely to wearable technology, uh, which is another stream at this event. As you can see, the wearable technology market has grown significantly over the last 10 years or so. In 2010, it was just under $20 billion, and by 2018, just under $50 billion. And there's many different application areas within that which have grown. Uh, a strong growth has come from smart watches, uh, fitness trackers less so. They, they had still a lot of growth in 2015, but that's now been subsumed to some extent by smart watches. But we see strong growth in AR and VR skin patches and so on. In many of these cases, some of these application areas have been utilizing improvements in sensors and other components which have been made for cell phones. They've now transitioned those same components to different applications, such as smart watches. Uh, but some of the new technologies which uh, we'll be looking at, including flexible and stretchable electronics, are also creating uh, completely new product areas or improving products such as smart skin patches. There's still, of course, a huge amount to be done here, and we'll be covering that at the event as well, such as power for VR and AR systems, uh, making this small, lightweight, but lot to last long enough for the device. And we'll be covering some of those challenges as well as the opportunity at the show. So moving on now to looking at change that's occurring within a few industries. I only have time here to look at a few, so I'm going to look specifically at healthcare first and then later on mobility. Uh, there'll be many more industries represented at this event, uh, which we'll go into much more detail about their particular sector. But looking at some of the trends in healthcare, two main trends that we see that we'll be covering in particular is the move from um, having uh, a delay in getting diagnostic. So for example, people provide a sample, it gets sent off to a lab, and then a few weeks later, they get the results back, to bringing that uh, to wherever the patient is and providing that diagnostics at the point of care. So providing it in a much faster way. This is being enabled in part by biosensors, and that will grow to a $43 billion market 10 years from now. Huge opportunity, quite a high barrier of entry, because of course healthcare is a very regulated process, uh, but for those that can see that through, uh, we expect that they will see uh, strong wealth and profit going forward. Another key trend we see is tackling the challenge of um, some of the existing diagnostic systems, which tend to uh, give very accurate readings, but traditionally they've been quite unpleasant or cumbersome to use. So a good example of that is a glucose test strip where people have to draw blood, and it's not a particularly pleasant thing to do, and therefore when you're taking these readings, you may not be taking them as often as you should, and you may think that your level is fine when you take them, but you might be missing all the points um, where it's not fine. And so there have been some approaches to overcome that and have more continuous monitoring. One approach to monitor, for example, uh, regular heart patterns is to use the system on the right here known as the Holt system. And here you have multiple electrodes with wires into a handbag of electronics which monitors your heart rate continuously. The problem is it's so cumbersome you only tend to wear it for um, a few hours, maximum about 12 hours. And you're not going around your normal routine because you're tethered and therefore you're not um, um, triggering um, the, the issues you may be experiencing. 
So to overcome that, so one of the key trends we see in healthcare is a shift away from these uncomfortable, um, but albeit very accurate tests, to um, a greater level of user comfort and continuous monitoring to capture many more data points. So we see that with uh, the revenue, for example, of diabetic test strips declining. Meanwhile, the revenue of continuous glucose monitoring skin patches greatly increasing. And similarly, that uh, Holt system I mentioned earlier is now being replaced by uh, patches, which can last for 30 days and provide a continuous stream of data. In some cases, they're not as accurate because they don't have as many electrodes, for example, or in the case of continuous glucose monitoring, they don't directly interface with the blood. However, uh, because they're continuously pulling data, you can see the relative changes and what is causing those changes based on your lifestyle. We think this is a particularly large market opportunity, uh, one which is $6 billion this year, growing to $10 billion in 2022. So that's healthcare. I'm now going to move to a, a completely different industry where there's a huge amount of change, and that is the electric vehicle sector. And if we look at the automotive industry, you know, for many years, the leaders in automotive internal combustion engines, or ICEs, have been at the top of this ivory tower. You know, the supply chain hasn't changed very much, and they've really dominated um, a very large industry. But all of that is now radically changing. And on the left here, we see a number of trends, um, which uh, are recent highlights as to why that's all changing. Firstly, we've seen that now, or just around now, we expect a peak in sales of internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, we've seen that last year in many different territories, sales of internal combustion engine vehicles have flatlined or even declined. Meanwhile, sales of electric vehicles continue to grow strongly. Indeed, last year, Tesla 3 was the best-selling luxury car in the US, beating internal combustion engine vehicles in its category, and that lead has continued through to the first quarter of this year. Then in addition to that, there's another radical change coming in, and that's from China. Um, IDTechX maintains a list of uh, the leading, um, sales leading sales of EV companies um, around the world, and we see that of the top 15 who sell electric vehicles, seven are Chinese companies, and the trend over the last few years is that they're moving up the list, whereas many of the other organizations are moving down. In fact, last year, the largest number of electric vehicles sold was in China, with over one million sold. That will slow down this year. We still expect it to grow, but growth may slow because some of the subsidies are being reduced in China. But what that means is that many of these car companies are looking now to export the electric vehicles more and more. And on top of that, 10 years out from now, we also expect to see a peak car scenario. So that means the total sales of cars, whether they're internal combustion engine or electric, will peak because we see greater autonomy in vehicles and therefore people calling cars on demand and not having to buy their own vehicle. So that means that we're seeing a lot of radical change in industry and uh, recently a study showed that the top 29 incumbent auto makers are investing $300 billion to move into EV, of which uh, in some cases they're lagging behind some of the other leaders. That's a huge investment they're making, uh, but of course it's a huge industry to go for. It's an industry worth some $2 trillion 10 years from now. And for everyone in the room, there's plenty of opportunities, whether it's materials, the thermal heat management, um, through to light weighting, um, and of course the components um, in the vehicle itself. So what are the escape routes for those companies? Well, here you see data from Mighty TechX about the market size for electric vehicles, all types of electric vehicles going forward over the next 20 years. And we maintain a list of over 60 types of electric vehicles, and we track sales of those and also forecast those. But you can see that moving forward 10 years, um, electric cars will dominate, but thereafter, that will be overtaken by electric buses and taxis. And we're going to see big new EV markets being created from nowhere, such as the robotic taxis and bus shuttles, which many automotive companies that we've spoken to agree with, and many of them are working on those platforms. It's a huge amount of change, but also a lot of new opportunities coming up for new mobility options. In terms of the components going to these vehicles, of course, um, energy storage is a critical part. At this event, we look at energy storage, whether it's new form factors such as flexible batteries, all the way through to uh, batteries and supercapacitors going into EVs. And we see that uh, many more gigafactories are being installed around the world, but by 2028, uh, the high majority, so over 90% of the batteries being produced, will be going into electric vehicles. 
Automotive companies here are taking very different approaches. Some are very vertical. They are making their own battery. Um, others are looking just to get good access to the materials, buying up 15 years of supply of cobalt so they can make sure that they uh, don't run out. The trend, whether it's consumer electronics or electric vehicles, is to move to faster, safer, and more energy-dense batteries. But all those three things are at odds with each other. And we've seen organizations move too quickly to make changes, not thoroughly test them, and that results in fires and bad PR and recalls. And so we'll see improvements in batteries, but they have to be measured and that they have to be thoroughly tested. This rise of batteries also gives um, another challenge, which is what we do with them when they're all expired. And in 2029, we expect about 3 million batteries to become available or expired from electric cars. And a lot of these will still have a reasonable amount of capacity. So there's now a business opportunity opening up to reuse these in second life applications, such as for stationary storage in residential grid and um, EV charging systems. So we've spoken quite a bit about different components and trends and industries. I'm now going to finish off by looking at um, a few key trends in materials and manufacturing innovations. Graphene is one of the uh, materials we look at at this event. Of course, we'll be looking at many other materials across all the other sectors as well. But if we look at the progress of graphene, we see that as of this year, it's a market of a few tens of millions of dollars. But one thing we've noticed over the last six months or so is that it's now really beginning to transition. Transition away from selling small quantities for test samples to being used by a number of brands for different applications where it adds true value. This is being driven in part by the lowering of prices. The material has now come down substantially. There's a lot of manufacturing uh, capability in place, particularly in China. But we see organizations such as Ford and Huawei using this for thermal heat management. Ford in the case of vehicles, Huawei in the form of consumer electronics. And for its strength to weight ratio, we see it being used for its mechanical properties in things like pipes and anti-corrosion paint in wind turbines. So it's really beginning to reach a turning point, and we expect that from about uh, 2021 onwards, we expect to see strong growth um, as the use and value of graphene is validated in these areas, uh, creating a market of a few hundred million dollars in 2028, which is the value of the material itself, and it's going to enable much larger markets if we look at the value of the final sector. Then moving on to manufacturing innovations. At this event, we look at 3D printing as one of the streams, and that's a market of $10 billion this year, rising to three times that 10 years out from now. We cover uh, the full range of 3D printing, and while there's been a lot of publicity around desktop 3D printers, sort of sub $5,000 printers, um, they've, they've been helpful to get a lot of publicity, but most of the value is in industrial 3D printing, which is only 8% of the number of 3D printers sold by unit number this year, but it's 90% of the revenue. And like many other printing industries, it's one which is very much a material business. So moving forward, uh, you can see in 2029 that the majority of the value of that $31 billion industry 10 years from now will be in materials. And of materials, we see particularly strong traction with metal 3D printing. And then last but not least, um, we come to the printing of electronics. So printed electronics, um, of course, is another focus of this event, and it's applicable to many of the things I've already discussed, from flexible electronics to some of the uh, structural components and so on. Um, but in particular, what you'll be seeing at this event are a range of companies who are talking about many new successes using uh, printing of electronics and other materials to create electronics and electrical components. In some cases, they're doing radical and very ambitious things, but we now have in the marketplace printed OLED displays from JOLED in Japan, um, and their aim is to um, scale these up and then license that know-how out to other display makers. Meanwhile, we have other organizations even looking to leapfrog OLED to move to ultimately to emissive quantum dot displays, and Samsung have set up a, uh, a fab now, a pilot fab, whereby they're doing a hybrid OLED and quantum dot display where they are inkjet printing the quantum dot materials. On the other side, in the middle here, we have organizations who are using printing to improve something, such as reduce cost or improve performance. And a really good example, which you'll be hearing about more at the event in a case study, is the use of inkjet printing for printing solder mask. This saves on a number of steps. It also allows the organizations to save material. They just apply material where they need it. And they can get PCBs out much more quickly because they can customize them and change design faster using inkjet printing. 
And then there are organizations who are creating completely new markets with print electronics, whether it's smart blister packs, uh, moving into things like smart packaging for retail, or a whole range of other smart labels. And these are organizations that are moving beyond that component play, which I mentioned at the start, and really pioneering new markets uh, by creating completely new solutions, um, which um, don't yet exist because they're the first people to do so. And you'll be hearing from many organizations who will be talking about some of the projects they're working on. So as you can see, there's a tremendous amount that's going to be uh, shared and talked about at this event, and they're just some of the key highlights that we'll be focusing on. We've over 250 speakers and a huge number of attendees, and if you haven't done so already, I recommend you use our matchmaking app, um, which is Brella. If you just go to your app store, you can download that, just search for the Brella app. And this allows you to um, have a matchmaking service, so you enter in a few details about what you do and what you're looking for, and it recommend other people you should meet. Uh, that's been very successful, we used it last year, and already today we have several hundred one-to-one -one meetings set up. We also have a record number of exhibitors this year. We've seen double-digit growth for the numbers of exhibitors, with uh, 211 coming from 27 countries. And in particular, I'd very much like to thank our gold sponsors, and also our silver sponsors. And then just so you can get your bearings, this is the exhibit uh, floor plan. Uh, there's a huge amount going on. We have a trade show theater, which will feature another 24 speakers, mainly exhibitors talking about some of their products, but also some really interesting forums as well, including Women in STEM and a China forum. In addition to all the way on the right here, uh, the IDTechX Launchpad, where 20 startups will be showcasing new concepts or new products, many of them showing it here at this event for the very first time. So I'd like to finish off just by uh, thanking you again for coming to this event. I hope you have a really productive show. Um, ID TechX provides um, a huge amount of data on all of these different topic areas. And one way we provide that is through a subscription service. So I recommend that you come by our booth, which is M15, and we will show you a demo of that, which will really help you to envisage how we deliver all that data and all that content, ultimately aiming to save you time by understanding these different complex technologies and markets, and therefore allowing you to make uh, better decisions as you move forward into these different innovative areas and seek to grow your business. So come by and we'll gladly show you a demo of that and tell you a bit more about the company. So thank you, very, thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions throughout the event, please don't hesitate to go to the registration booth or to the ID Tech X booth and we'll help you. And I'd now like to uh, introduce the coming lineup this morning. So we have two further cornerstone presentations. Uh, following that, the format will be is that the trade show will then open, and then after the trade show, we'll be coming back into eight separate rooms, one for each of the topics, and you'll be hearing the keynote presenters from each of those different topic areas, and then we go into the full agenda.